All right, let's get through this. This is probably my least favorite chapter in the world. Uh, when we look at infants, birth to one year, they have every age group has these different characteristics. They have weights. All right, the head in an infant is huge. The body's small. They're they're all cartilage. All right. The different things, the airway is very narrow, so you have to keep the infant in a neutral, the airway in a neutral position. They are not necessarily, they're more mouth breathers than they use their belly. They're, they're abdomen breathers. So that's one way to, one deal to look at. You sort of have to judge the weight of the baby. Everything in pediatrics is measured uh, milligrams per kilogram. It's, everything is measured by weight. And really, all medicines measured by weight, but we take the shortcuts with adults. We just give this huge range of uh, dose. So, antibodies passing through there. It's it's been proven, well proven, that breastfeeding is is much better than bottle feeding, and uh, that's not a huge characteristic for it, uh, a an infant, except that when you look at an infant, the infant de uh, develops a very strong bond between mom and infant. That doesn't take place between dad and infant. That In that early development, it's between mom and infant. So you go out there and you try to w help the infant, right? And uh, try to take an infant away from their mom. doesn't really work that well. They have a good sense of that bond, and they don't know you. They can sense that. So like a German shepherd. You know, they, they, they know they're the one who feeds them, but they don't know who you are. The other thing is they get very startled uh, very quick. They don't see that well. So you get up over the top of them, and you start making all these rash movements. It startles the infant, so the infant will start crying. Once they start crying, then it's very hard to assess their breathing because all you hear is crying. That would go into documentation where you can't assess the breathing. They're just crying. You know they have an open airway because they're crying, but you can't really assess the breathing. So they, they have the different reflexes uh, where they grab stuff and they, they sort of jerk, but different pulse points, you, you couldn't check a pulse on that little fat neck, so the brachial pulse, huh? not necessarily a good radial pulse, but a good brachial pulse, when you start checking uh, pulse points on the little kiddo, all these little kids, they, they explore through their mouth, and they have very uh, different sleeping patterns, probably more than anything with pediatrics, is this different sleeping pattern. I cannot tell you how many times I've been out to people's house, new mom, second, third babies, not the same. New moms, it's 10 o'clock at night. The baby doesn't seem as responsive as they normally is, and the mom gets scared. The baby sort of, they said, oh, they're sort of lifeless. They just sort of lay there, hundred. right? We get out to the house, and it's like, it's, well, it's 10 o'clock at night. The baby's... Did he nap today? No, no, you know, we've been out running all day. Okay, so the baby's what? Tired. Sleepy. Same way with little kids. Kids are used to not running like that. They're tired. So, you, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it happens all the time you get out there. They're tired. That's why they, they're like that. They want to go to sleep. There's nothing wrong with them. It's a natural characteristic for them. Uh, also, when you start talking about new moms and these little infants, they feed them. What happens when you overfeed feed a baby? They throw up. What happens when, when you guys overeat? They get fat. They get fat. Yeah. That's true. But if you overeat to the point of that baby, what do you do? You're probably going to throw up too. You know, try to get fat. So what happens is the babies throw up and they start gagging on their, their vomit, that food that they're being force fed. 
because mom just wants them to be quiet and go to sleep. And uh, so they turn a little blue, they get a little cyanotic, and they start gagging. So we have to go out to the new mom's house and say, okay, not to be mean, but what do you do when you throw up? Do you gag? Yeah. So as a baby. You know, if you were to look in the mirror when you're throwing up and gagging on your puke, you'd probably turn blue too. So the, uh, you sort of have to explain to them sort of the natural characteristics, especially the ones that don't uh, bother to go to the baby classes. And that helps out quite a bit if they do. Remember the tops of the heads are very soft. Don't play with them. You know, you get those spot nails. Don't keep pushing your finger in there because the brain's right underneath. It's, it's tempting. It's like that sign that says white, wet paint, right? You want to touch it. Don't, don't mess around with the font nails. Decreased font nails are a sign of dehydration, one sign. And then if they're bulging for some reason in the font nails, it could be a head injury. You could have some sort of pressure inside the skull. But uh, mainly for dehydration. So they get this bonding issue, this trust. Uh, they start getting that temperament, you know, right, right in this area where they you know, they, they eventually they start sleeping at night. But for the most part, and we're, we're going back there this year to try to work with the baby some more. That's why we go to the early head start to try to get you guys used to, if you're not already, if you don't have younger uh, kids at the house, get you used to sort of working with the little kids. Did y'all go to the baby place? Yeah, so the we'll, we'll go back there for a little bit this summer, I mean, this year to to try to, to to get there, and especially with the booger eaters at Head Start, try to sort of work with them. All right, so you move out of that infant stage into the toddler stage. When they're in this toddler stage, uh, they start developing their systems, getting stronger, they're sleeping through the night. They start getting teeth. They still try to explore everything through their mouth. So if it's on the floor, they don't pick it up, put it in their mouth, and, and taste it to see if it's, if it's any good. Uh, uh, they, under, they understand no. They start to understand don't do that, no. Uh, they still distrust. They still have this big distrust thing. Very curious. Uh, they don't like to get away from mom or dad, they start bonding with the, the male end of this uh, thing during this age. You know, when you go and you, you see the little kids and they tuck behind their leg and they hang onto the legs like a leech, you know, you're trying to kick it off and this little leech. They don't, they don't necessarily like you. They don't know what you're going to do. They don't have that thought process yet. But they know that you're not mom or dad. Yeah, stranger danger, you know. I guess from an early age. Huh? But uh, they see mom does do something and they start doing something. Huh? So you've got to be sort of careful with these little guys. On all these pediatric patients, you have to gain a trust with them before you start the assessment. In adult, we tell them to go to head to toe. In the child, we tell them to go sort of start their feet and sort of work and gain a trust and... Uh, where they know that you're, you're not going to hurt them. Most little kids are healthy, you know, so don't have a lot of pediatric emergencies because the kids are healthy. So you don't get a lot of experience in this. Uh, once you have children, then it's easier to work with pediatric patients. Uh, same with me. It's easy for me uh, to work with teenagers on the ambulance than my partner because I've been with them 187 days out of the year, right? So I know those characteristics more than my partner's do. My partner's not used to working with teenagers. Drives them crazy. You know, the same way with younger kids. I have three boys. I have three boys. So I'm used to that and that helps out as far as being able to work with the little kids. Uh, I know that when I go to the, a teenager's house, 
uh, and they don't want to do something that I want them to do, and I'm going to treat them under that implied consent, right? Then I just need to be more forceful with them. When my partner tries to, uh, you know, be more diplomatic because he's not used to working with teenagers, I know that that's not going to work. So I just go to their house and get on the cot. They're giving me a hard time. I don't cot. <laughs> you know, and they go and sit down. Same way with sort of middle school till uh, like the middle school age, you just get over the top of them, you know, and, and try to get them to do what they want to. They're harder though, little brats. So here are three to five. Now they're, you know, they're out of that toddler stage. They're not exploring much. They're not eating as much dirt as they used to eat. Right? They're developing things about their body that they know. Uh, they're developing other bonds other than mom or dad. Unfortunately here, like you said, what is it? Danger stranger, right? Stranger they, danger. Strange, huh? Stranger danger. Stranger danger. And so when you go in there, uh, you guys are strange and dangerous. But the, uh, so when you go into the house, they're automatically set on guard because they don't know who you are. They know that uh, a lot of times the parents lie to them. Probably your parents lied to you the same way. Like if they see a police officer, they say, you know, you're acting up in the back seat, they're driving down the road, and they look back and say, if you don't be quiet, that police officer is going to come put you in jail. <laughs> really? Why do you want to lie to your kid? <laughs> so the little kid goes, I don't want to go to jail. So they sort of, yeah, same way. They see us, and they say, if you don't be quiet, they're going to, they're going to give you a shot. And I, I, I've had moms tell right in front of me. And I'm like, I'm not going to give him a shot. Why are you saying that? Don't mind him. <laughs> they're making, automatically, they're making them afraid of us. I've had kids of this age group, I'd go in their house to treat their mom or dad, right? Or something, and they'd start crying. Because just because, I mean, I I don't think it's my looks, but they, they look at me and start crying. You know? Maybe it is my looks, but I don't know. So, all this, they're developing social skills now. Now they're so advanced, I mean, these guys are, they're still eating baby food and playing with iPads, right? I mean, so this age group here, I mean, they have smartphones. So, I mean, you've got this... They develop a lot quicker. Probably, also here, with they develop in these social skills more where they're starting to be left maybe at daycare or pre-care. So they're... Because uh, a lot of times now, both parents work. So there's, there's skills here that they're, they're used to being separated you can always tell when the three to five year old is not in, uh, doesn't have a working bomb, which is usually the case, and they stay at home because they're real attached to their their mom. So they're harder for you to treat because they they get that separation anxiety. A lot of times, what I'll do is I'll have the mom hold the child as I do my assessment. That way, they feel better. Even with the toddler, I won't take the child away from the mom. I'll have the mom hold him and, and try to do all my assessment with the mom holding the baby. Now, this is a non-critical patient, right? A critical patient, you do what you've got to do. But the uh, here, you know, non-critical, not life-threatening, you try to work around having the kid to... Uh, Stay sort of calm. So, the, the three to five, now they're not going to back to that three to five year old, they're not going to be able to answer your questions as far as your medical questions. So don't be giving them those sample thing, right? They're not, it's not, I mean, they can tell you to hurt, 
what happens with the with the little kid is that you start your assessment on them and you say, does it hurt here? Yeah. What about here? Yeah. <laughs> here? Here? Yeah. So everywhere that it hurts. Right? Because <laughs> they think they're going to get more suckers at the end of the day. They hurt more, I guess. Right? So the uh, what I do when I'm doing my physical exam on the on the child, I will just I won't ask them. I'll just sort of you know like if I want to see if their abdomen's tender, I'll just push on their abdomen and then uh, watch for a grimace on their face. Like if I push down, they you know I can see that, and I know that that was painful because they will just tell you everything hurts for the most part. So the assessment is quite difficult on that age group. But when you get to these guys here, that's a big jump. A six-year-old should probably know if they're allergic to any medication, or if they have allergies to bee stings, or they have other type. Now, they won't know a lot about their medical history, but their parents should be informing them, especially as they breach that upper part of that, right? A 12-year-old, they need to know about their, their medical history and their medications, Listen that, that what they take, all right, and or why they take it. However, the, the three to five year old, so as we progress in the year, the three to five year old is not necessarily worried about this as much yet. When you get up into this sort of school age thing, they get really worried about their looks and what people think of them. So that and you know, like, oh no, I'm gonna break an arm and I'm gonna look like Frankenstein. You know, they start looking at the thing about getting an accident and, and hurting their face or something. So all these different characteristics are are coming back together. One thing that you tell I try to tell them if it's not critical, saying you're you're going to be okay. This is not going to leave a scar. But I also Try not to lie to them. If I had to start an IV on them, I'm going to tell them this is going to hurt. But just depending on what IV I start. Like if I have to start a small IV, I tell them usually kids. I say this is probably going to be like a fire ant bite in North Texas. Every kid knows what a fire ant bite feels like. I say this don't feel like a fire ant bite. Okay, and I go ahead and stick them. And they're like, oh yeah. If if they need fluid or they need a bigger IV. So have you ever been stung by a bee? Because you're about to. <laughs> this is going to sting. This is going to hurt a little bit. So you're truthful with them. And a lot of these kids can, you know, they can take that. They're all right with it. So let's look at these 12-year-olds. They're losing. They're, they're growing up. They take less supervision. They, they're aware of themselves. They value their, the opinions of their peers. That's very important as far as, as you start treating them. They, they should be able to be good historians for you as you talk to them. What you will run into here when you start talking to this age group, mom will try to interject when you're trying to talk to the patient. It's important to hear what mom has to say, but you also have, have to hear what the patient's telling you as well. So look at that. Look at those two different things there as far as taking the patient's uh, word on it, even though they're six, seven, ten years old, they can still, they, they got rational thought, they can make decisions, okay? And then taking what mom has to say. Who's going to lie to you the most? What do you think the mom? I don't know, I guess she wants to, I guess she's trying to lie for the kids so the kid doesn't really feel scared. That's true, that could be. So, when, when you're, why is the kids going to lie to you? Because they want to go to the hospital. Yeah, they don't want to go with you. They don't want to get stuck with a needle. That's all they think about. I don't want to get stuck with a needle. I don't want a shot. So, they don't want to tell you, no, that doesn't hurt because they don't want to get stuck. Mom wants everything to look good for the little kid. You're right on that. Right? So you have to sort of take what comes in and digest it out and figure out what's truth. 
you know, and, and sometimes that's difficult in these, in these younger age groups. Now, these guys are you, right? For the most part. Not the, the lower end of it, but towards the upper end in this adolescence, young adulthood. Uh, get big. They know what's taking place. So they get real big. They, they want independence. They're huge about their image and what other the peers think about them. That is a big thing. And they're always really scared about that. Is this going to be disabling? Is this going to disable me? All right. uh, they haven't really developed this for the most part. And I'm just saying people in general, you know, that uh, if, if they're out at midnight and, and you get called out for asthma attack at midnight, and they were supposed to be in at 10.30, you know, they're going to tell you any sorts of things. Right? So you have to sort of use common sense, okay, uh, when you get older and you start working with teenagers as far as patients concerned, you just have to remember back, like, oh yeah, I remember that, right? But uh, they should be able to tell you all their medical history, their allergies, where they hurt, where they don't hurt. They shouldn't be necessarily scared of you, right? I mean, they may be scared in the situation, but they, they shouldn't be scared of you because they know that you're just not going to stick them with the... Sh you're not going to give them a shot. You're not going to stick them with the needle unless you have to, right? Something like that. So they know that, uh, they're aware of their surroundings for the most part. And, and you live in this, so you're, you're, you're primarily aware of this, that, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old age, age group. They think more about their car than they knew their, their body a lot of times. I've had teenagers in wrecks that were scared to death about their car, not being able to get their car fixed. So blunt, you have an open femur fracture. <laughs> you know, don't worry about your car. Oh, but my, it's my car. You know? Okay, do you understand the femur fracture? Your femur's broken. It doesn't matter about your car. And they get all worked up about they crashed their car. Or their parents are going to be so mad that they crashed their car. Or something, right? Or their parents are so mad because they're, they're, they're out late. Oh, you can't call my parents. I have to call your parents. You know? No, no, no. They think I'm over at Sue's house spending the night. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> you know? I've had them lie to me about their age. You know, oh, I'm 18. Really? You got any ID? Both they are 18. Right, they're adults then. Yeah, so, you know, the uh, if you're 18, I, I have... That's a, if, if you fall in that 18 category, I can't contact your parents. Your parents can actually come up to me and ask me medical questions about you. I'm like, I can't tell you. You need to go ask your young adult child. They're 18. I can't, I can't tell you. I've ran into that too with, with my youngest son. I'm trying to get medical stuff done and uh, it's just sometimes easier for me to do it. And I said, Dad... We can't tell you. <laughs> Have your son come up here and we'll tell him. Ah. You know? And I understand that, but the... Uh, Have you ever had a parent get mad at you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot of parents get mad at me. Do you care? No. <laughs> so the... Uh, I mean, you, you know how you feel and it's about your, your you know your health and the information that you know so you sort of fit into that uh, that that time zone 19 this is a huge gap that's 21 years right 20 year gap there's a lot that takes place between your 19 and your 40 let me just tell you everything they say about turning 40 is true <laughs> okay so you don't lose weight as easy. Your hearing goes bad. 
your sight goes bad, your digestive system gets all screwed up. So, and it just keeps going downhill from there. Just to let you know, that, that 40 is like the breaker deal there. But, I mean, you've developed the habits, you know. Uh, you can tell people about your health, jobs. You get into marriages, get into families. Uh, you start raising the younger children, right, through, through all these. So adults, for me, uh, are much easier to take care of. Between probably about, I don't know, 15 upward are easier to take care of. Below 15, they sometimes don't have enough information. But 15 and up, it's usually pretty easy to, easy to take care of those guys because they know all the information that I'm trying to get out of them. They're adults. Now when you get into an older group here, where you know the body system starts slowing down, you have to understand that uh, they don't move as well. They have aches and pains. You know, so if you were to come out and do an assessment, they said, have any pain? Yeah, I have back pain. That would be an open-ended question, right? Because I always have back pain. So the, uh, I mean, so when you get into your assessment type questions, you want to ask closed-ended questions, especially as they get older, they get less flexible, the digestive system doesn't work as well, the memory doesn't work as well, the sight, the hearing, the body temperature regulation, it's not, it's not as good. Right? So the, uh, here you can just sort of picture your, your, your parents as far as their uh, development through that. Right? Most of them are set in, in jobs by now. Right? Uh, um, some, as you get probably more upward of, of the 60 mark, have different medical histories. You know, maybe they didn't take good care of themselves, so they have a lot of medical problems in there. So you, those are the things that you have to look at as far as that's concerned. Oh, yeah, weight control. Tell me about it. Jeez. Heart disease. Here, during this age here, it's just a matter of how well you, you took care of yourself when you were younger. You stay, you exercise, you eat good. When you get in your 40s, you're going to be okay. I'm 51, and I, I, besides my lower back, I'm in good health. So the, uh, I, I don't have too many issues with that. But that's just preparation as you grow older. A lot of, I mean, I've taken care of people my age that were dying. I mean, they were, their heart was full of fat, and you know, I mean, mine's full of bluebell, but theirs was full of fat and cheeseburgers and all that. And they're having heart attacks at an early age. You know, they can't function, they can't walk. So as you get older, these things take take place if that person doesn't, you know, if if they're not responsible for their own health. So. Kids start leaving. All of a sudden now, you start taking care of your parents. Because right? they're getting older and you have to start taking care of them. So the uh, different psychological changes there. And then you get much older in the 60s and, and older. Uh, this is where typically you get into patients with a lot of medical problems. You know, uh, but... The other day, I picked up a lady that was 100 years old that, besides being 100, she didn't have any medical problems. She was, she was pretty good. So the uh, death and dying, your friends start dying off, uh, different living environment, maybe you can't cook for yourself, maybe your spouse died or something, you have a hard time cooking for yourself. And then definitely the body systems become less and less proficient. Okay?